Hi, I'm Christy Ballantyne, joining you from Boston at the Cardiac Metabolic Health Congress. And I have with us our keynote speaker, Peter Libby, who gave us a tremendous overview of inflammation. And I got to say, Peter, from when this meeting started 19 years ago to now, incredible progress. But if you could share with our audience some of the highlights in just what's been happening and how exciting we are moving forwards. Yeah, well, you know, we, we have a real paradox is that our toolkit for addressing cardiometabolic disease is growing by leaps and bounds, and we're sitting on a wealth of wonderful evidence that we can help people and reduce some of that risk due to cardiometabolic challenges. But the problem is that if we take a global perspective, the burden of cardiometabolic risk factors is increasing worldwide. And one of the points that I made in my talk is keeping me up at night. You know, as a grandfather, uh, I think that we're losing the battle with youth. Mm -hmm. That uh, childhood obesity and attendant dysmetabolism is on the rise. And not just in rich countries, no. but in low and middle income countries. As uh, the lifestyles change to decrease the physical activity and adoption of a Western type diet, uh, we export fast food, we export cigarettes. And I think that we are sowing the seeds for a global pandemic of chronic disease, including cardiometabolic diseases. So I think that there's this, just this terrific disconnect between all that we can offer and how we're actually losing the battle. You know, I showed data in the talk that I had gleaned from the global burden of disease that low and middle income countries actually surpassed the high-income countries in 2006 and the burden of cardiovascular disease so that the greatest burden resides not in the rich countries but in the countries that are still in development. And even in our country what we see as individuals we see tremendous discrepancies sure. the most disadvantaged groups having the worst access to good foods, exercise, lifestyle and then unfortunately the greatest morbidity and mortality. Right, so in the U.S., zip codes tell us a lot yeah. about your cardiovascular future, maybe as much as the polygenic risk score. Yeah. Uh, and their food deserts, and you know, I, I, I lived uh, for 43 years in Jamaica Plain, and uh, if I had to shop in the local market, it was very hard to find uh, good food in a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood where I lived for 43 years. So I have uh, up close and personal concerns about the uh, availability of healthy foods. So um, really we we have this uh, terrific uh, paradox between the good things we can do and how we're sort of losing the battle locally and, and globally. Um, so that's that's one of my concerns. And the, the other part of my talk was say we have uh, five, six, seven different wonderful tools for addressing the lipid profile and you and your talk uh, earlier uh, went through some of the emerging tools, which I'm sure some of which will actually prove very beneficial in terms of outcomes, not just the numbers. Uh, but then a lot of the people who are showing up these days, and younger people, don't have the traditional risk factors. And so that's what gets me up in the morning to go to the lab and dig more because we're learning more about non-traditional risk factors. I spoke about Gemma Figfree's idea of the uh, myocardial infarction without standard modifiable risk factors. That's a mouthful, so she shortened it to smurfless mm -hmm. and uh, not relating to a little blue cartoon character, but the absence of traditional risk factors. And um, that's where I think uh, a lot of my research effort is. It's in trying to look at some of those non-traditional risk factors where we don't have enough knowledge or tools. So inflammation is certainly one, and uh, I was fortunate to be able to contribute to some of the early work on the pathophysiology of inflammation and some of the clinical trials that first demonstrated that inflammation is a target for reducing cardiovascular disease. But I also spoke in my talk about how we need to strive for identifying the sweet spot where we can limit inflammation without undue inhibition of host defenses or tumor surveillance. And so uh, while we've joined the battle, we have a long way to go. And I spoke about, well, we know colchicine is effective, but 
Gee, when I was last on inpatient service, I did a back of the envelope uh, poll. The, the median ETFR in my population during a two week rotation was 45. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that I'm worried about giving colchicine, at least in the standard doses. So um, we still have uh, a ways to go. Colchicine is not going to be a panacea for everyone. And we still have to worry about the total mortality and about some of the infection risk with. Uh, with colchicine, uh, but it's very encouraging, and we have FDA approval of colchicine now, but it's widely underutilized, even people who meet the entry criteria for those trials, like Colcott and Lodoco 2. But then going upstream in the pathway, which I was fortunate to be able to help elucidate, uh, we have the inflammasome, which is a danger-sensing macromolecular structure in the cell that uh, can sense danger signals like cholesterol crystals. Uh, and then can activate the precursor of interleukin 1 beta and generate active interleukin 1 beta. So we can go upstream of interleukin 1 beta to attack the inflammasome. There are programs in biotech and pharma to do that. And then we can go a step down and attack interleukin 6, which is strongly induced by IL 1, as we showed in our laboratory back in the uh, late 1980s and early 90s. And we now have a tool to neutralize IL-6, an antibody called ziltabecumab, which is now in three large-scale clinical trials, which are very exciting because the human genetic data strongly support the causality of interleukin-6 in human atherothrombosis. So exciting times, Christy, and this meeting is a wonderful opportunity to share our enthusiasm and our discoveries and also our concerns about the challenges with the wonderful audience that you have assembled here. So the importance of inflammation, starting with our lifestyle, which is unfortunately highly pro-inflammatory, ending up with molecular targets, which have come about from basic research. It's really exciting, Peter. Uh, it's thrilling to watch what's where we stand. And, but as you said also, it's very worrisome in terms of the need to implement some lifestyle and societal changes along with developing these targeted therapies. They have to go hand in hand. And that's why I, I challenged our audience today. I said, okay, we have our one-on-one -on -one encounters with a patient in our consulting rooms, but then we also are citizens. And uh, we have a responsibility, in my view, to go to our PTA meetings, uh, to, I'm doing Grandparents Day uh, <laughs> <laughs> on November 8th, and uh, to city hall, uh, town hall meetings, and uh, militate for a healthier environment. We need to be concerned about uh, global warming, about air pollution. We need to be uh, concerned about getting sugar-sweetened beverages that are high fructose and that are toxic out of our schools. And we need to really encourage a healthy lifestyle by building um, sidewalks in our subdivisions and bicycle paths to protect uh, people who want to not use the automobile to get from point A to point B. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.